Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do the class today. Scott had called me this morning. So, like I said, it was about 9, uh, 15, a quarter to 9. So um, I wasn't really, didn't know what to do exactly. He suggested, uh, the, well, some of the newest time charts uh, give him, uh, share with him that it would be good to go over that. And uh, so uh, that's what uh, we're going to do this morning is look at some interesting timelines and stuff like that. And uh, let's open with prayer, though. Uh, open with prayer with both Scott and his wife. They're both sick, very sick today. They've had a fever for two days, I guess. So I have a few handouts printed up. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Here we go. You pass those around. And uh, I want to start with a verse. Uh, you, you bring your Bibles. Uh, let's take a look at First Peter. Or, yeah, it's First Peter. 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer for to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. It's kind of appropriate for me this morning, because the last minute, like, uh, I didn't know, but I was asked to do this. I really didn't figure on doing another class in uh, this church, actually. Uh, my classes had concluded, and... Uh, they were a bit stressful sometimes because a lot of information to come across with. And uh, a bit nervous for sure. Talk about fear and trembling. I was uh, fear and trembling over there sometimes. Which fear, we've talked about in the class, is not a good thing to be involved in. We've got to walk in love. Yeah. It cancels all fear. And as we walk in love, then we have more of a purpose. Yeah. It's not a self-defense or a run and hide mechanism, but instead it's like a go to war mechanism on behalf of somebody else. Yeah. But we're going to go ahead and talk about some things this morning. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3, 1. Who would like to turn there? There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. So, God has a time. And he, that's what we're going to discuss right now is times, uh, timelines, basically. Now, God's sovereign. He sets up patterns. He sets up His timelines. He sets up the seasons. We can't control the seasons. For instance, if it's winter, we can't just make it summer. But we can control what we do in the winter. If it's springtime, we can't make it winter. We can control what we do at springtime. In that season, it's time to plant if you're a farmer. If you don't plant, then you're not going to harvest later. So we have opportunities. We have obligations to recognize what season it is. Is it planting season? Is it harvest season? What season is it for me in my life? Um, God will basically set up a time for His Word to come through each one of His Christians, His children, at a particular time in a day. Today is a day that God has set up divinely that I would be here in this class. I had, yesterday I had no idea this was going to happen. Uh, I didn't have a clue. I was working out in the yard. I was doing work. We're building a garage, actually. And uh, I didn't... Uh, Scott tried to get a hold of me yesterday, but didn't. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually in bed when I wake up. I was sleeping in a little bit. And uh, as I woke up that phone call, I, I really didn't know what to say. But uh, <laughs> God had it in mind to do this. I'm so, glad you're here. So I'm glad to be here too. Right. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the seasons of time that God has for Morning. this creation Morning. that we recognize at this Morning. point. Did everybody get one of these papers? <clears throat> yeah, okay. This is the last handout that I just handed out. We can, the we can, end of sin. We can share. You can have There's a season of sin. And uh, it actually will be educational. And uh, the season of sin was started, and we'll see where it started. Actually, it started after the creation of angels and before the creation of Adam. It's a season of sin. And uh, it'll show future generations the results of sin. It's corruption and destruction. And it destroys what is perfect. And everybody in the future beyond this season of sin will be educated and not be involved or want to go into sin. Yes? May I ask a question? Sure, Kim. Because that's knowledge I've never had or learned before. Mm -hmm. Was Satan or Satan thrown out of heaven before or after this season of sin was... That's a good question, and that's what we're going to start with. This graph actually talks about that. So let's take a look, and they're numbered. If you notice that the, the timeline here begins with the creation of angelic, uh, well, the creation of angels, including Lucifer. Lucifer was an angel. He was created perfect. And so the Bible verses are right here in this handout. 
So let's look up each one of these Bible verses. There's 17 of them. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at Ezekiel 28. So you can look ahead, uh, but go ahead and let's look at uh, these verses and read these background verses to support this timeline. Who's got that first uh, verse, Ezekiel 28, 14 and 15? <clears throat> they are the anointed church that covers... Cherubim, actually. Cherub, I'm sorry. Cherub, yeah. <laughs> oh, I need my reading glasses. That's all right. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Now who's that talking about? Adam. That is Adam. not Adam. Eve. That is not Eve. Satan. 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 Satan was created a great angel. He was, in my opinion, I think he's one of the first angels created. God didn't poof everything at once, I don't believe. He has infinity to work with. So he created, I think, possibly Satan number one first. If not, then he created three or four angels at the same time. Uh, the anointed cherub, uh, Gabriel, and, uh, and a couple others, uh, Michael. And uh, Satan had a little different name. So I think he was actually the, f the first created and therefore the most worthy adversary if there ever was to be somebody to challenge God. He was in charge of the praise and worship in heaven. Wouldn't he create them all at the same time? Why would he? He didn't create all mankind at the same time. He created two, and from there he made more and more. Mm -hmm. And if he's got all this infinite time, <laughs> when did he create it? Poof, right here? No, he develops things. Right. And we see how he develops things over our own history. Mm -hmm. He created uh, his own book, the Bible, over a long period of time, the Word. So he introduces one thing, and then another thing. It never gets old in heaven. There's new creations. Behold, I do a new thing, the Bible says. So he's doing new things on a regular basis. When we get to heaven, it's not stagnant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like all of a sudden, wow, I've never seen that coming. You know, that's a whole new dimension of stuff. And we don't know what God's got in his mind. But in the past history, we've got an idea of what he's done by his word. And, he, and I believe that Satan would have been created as one of the earliest creations. It refers here that he was perfect. Mm -hmm. He was desirable in every way as far as he was powerful. He, was, he looked great. There was nothing false about him. Nothing, nothing that was bad about him. So much so that he became proud. Mm -hmm. That was his downfall. That downfall. That's yeah, what happened to him. That's when that. sin entered his heart. Was, he not only was proud of himself, but then he became envious. Because Jesus is not created. He is God, the third part of God. <laughs> Jesus is always it was. It's hard for us to comprehend, because we all have a beginning. It's hard for us to comprehend a God with no beginning. But the Trinity has no beginning. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is the Son. He was there in the, before the beginning. And he was there when Satan was created. Satan was a special creation. Who knows what the environment was, but it's angelic. I mean, that was heavenly. And he was an angel. And uh, then after a while, had more creations. The more creations. Until there was probably billions of angels. There was a lot of angels, no doubt. And uh, Satan was in charge of praising Jesus, God. And then he started wanting to usurp some of that reflected on himself. Yeah, I'm pretty great myself, you know. You know, I can do all these things. Hey, I'm older than you. I know more than you. Oh, yeah. this. And he, he got himself a little bit proud and puffed up. And all of a sudden he decides, you know what? I want to sit on that seat of, of, of authority. I want people to actually bow down to me. The power. The power corrupted him. Now, power doesn't corrupt. The heart corrupts. And his heart became corrupted. See, power doesn't corrupt because Jesus had a heart. And he was uncorruptible. Oh, let's look at Luke 10, 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is Jesus speaking. That's Jesus speaking, New yeah. Testament, yeah. recorded in the Gospels. He's reflecting back to this time long ago, before Adam. Yeah. Because actually Jesus was there. And in Satan, there's more to read about these things. We're just touching the high points uh, that make the point, because I have them all illustrated here, and we're going to see the big picture for a minute of the season of sin. And uh, so Satan 
became corrupted, and said he had to be cast out of heaven. Jesus is referring to that right here. He was cast out like lightning. He was a great angel. He fell to the earth. He cast down. His uh, casting down is continuing. He's been cast out of heaven, down to the earth. Someday he's going to be cast down to the pit. He's going to have a little, uh, we're going to get into in some of that. But eventually he's going to be cast down into a lake of fire. That's his destiny. He's not there yet. Can you yes. ask a quick question? Yes. How could he become so bad in heaven with mm -hmm. one third of the angels that were thrown out with him? Mm -hmm. and, and through history of mankind writing through the Bible mm -hmm. and, and our knowledge that he is so bad. He's like 180 degrees from God. Of how that took place in heaven before he was even thrown out. Well, I think I got the drift of your question, and uh, there is some, uh, that's kind of what we're kind of trying to address, is that he was perfect, mm -hmm. but then the light went out in his heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And corruption sat in, because it says sin was found within him. Mm -hmm. So the 180 degrees uh -huh. happened to Adam and Eve, and we're going to get into them in a minute. Mm -hmm. They were perfect, mm -hmm. and then the light went out. Mm -hmm. And when the light goes out, you've got 180 degrees. You got black light, actually. Being in heaven with all the knowledge that those heaven people have. Okay, you're talking about the knowledge of why he would have done that, correct? Now let me just uh, illustrate a little bit that he was perfect, and he was leading all these angels. He had lots of friends, lots of power, and he basically desired more. Mm -hmm. See, he desired what Jesus had. He didn't have that. It's sort of like the Garden of Eden. They said you could eat of every tree in the garden. Yeah. But so, this one is God's. The knowledge of good and evil. It may be that simple. That one thing is what you cannot partake with. That's God's. Mm -hmm. But they were drawn to it. Just like little kids. They're drawn to, don't do that. Well, why can't I do that? <laughs> you know, how far can I go here? That's a good point. Because That's, kids do it. Their kids do it. It's a natural <laughs> thing. <laughs> you desire what you can't have when yes. you enter this point of pride. See, thinking that it's me, it's all focused on me, and all of a sudden, who am I? Well, why can't I do that? Yeah. I have a right to that. Mm -hmm. And we start looking at rights mm -hmm. in our own position. Mm -hmm. We want to be like that. We want to step up. Now, it's okay to step up if God's bringing you up, but in Satan's case, he wanted to step up to an unauthorized position. He wanted to replace God. He wanted to at least be equal with God. Wow. So, that's where he corrupted. The second thing is, he was ignorant. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. Satan had never seen sin. Nobody in heaven had ever seen sin. Nobody had ever seen God as a warrior. God was only the loving Father. He was the Creator. He did all these good things. They didn't know that there was a dimension of God that could defend Himself. Could defend His creation. Because there was never anything to defend against. So all of a sudden, in their ignorance, just like Adam and Eve was ignorant, in their ignorance, <clears throat> they stepped out into a position that had never been there before. A position of corruption. They were in a perfect place. And then they decided, you know what? There's this one point that God's keeping me from. And if I enter there, it's called sin. But I think, I don't understand sin, but I think I would like to do that anyway. And so Satan was the first one to do that. So he stepped over, and he started gathering followers, just like Absalom did to, to um, King David, his father. Mm -hmm. He started attracting people to him. He started making his father kind of not look as good. He started making himself look a little better. He said, hey, I want to be your king someday. Yeah. You know, start gathering his followers. No doubt those were the ones that one-third of the people that followed him to corruption, mm -hmm. that he became really united with, and trying to, in a sense, overthrow God's creation, or at least be a part of it to the point where he was un not authorized to be that part, a part where he was a leader of his own society, mm -hmm. which he did become that, but what he didn't realize in becoming a leader of his own society, a society was actually authored by sin and corruption, the society would self-consume itself and be corrupted immediately. Wow. Yes? Like this question. Why would God, if before humankind was created, the earth was created, allow sin to live 
and especially the one third of angels to live, not only live, be thrown out, I can understand, but be given control to a very high degree over earth to put us in the same space that he is in. Why would he do that? That's a if good he question. Created the universe that is 14 and a half billion years old. Well, that's a theory. It's such a but simple thing. Sure, that's a theory. And one thing, uh, and we're going to actually address that throughout this class. That's the reason for uh, this chart, actually. And you're talking about the end of the chart, and we're going to get there, the reasons why. Um, to start with, uh, we may not get there. Uh, I have three other charts, actually. <laughs> but we obviously aren't going to get to those. But uh, let's go ahead and, because uh, we're just on uh, point two almost. And so let's go ahead and uh, just take a look at this and keep that thought in mind. There's a reason. There's a very good reason. One of the reasons, there's multiple reasons, but one of the reasons is free choice. Yeah. God didn't well. create puppets. Now, he could have created everybody as a puppet and a robot. Better but in order to have free choice, you've got to have a choice. So if I had no choice, then I can't choose. I only have one direction. But if I have a choice, like Satan had a choice, he wasn't to usurp this authority. That was his choice not to for a very long time. Eventually, he changed his mind. And he decided, you know what, I am going to choose to sin and create my own society. And then he actually was saying, well, you can't be a part of my society, God would tell him. And you would have to be separated from me. And so he didn't realize the consequences. So immediately, his light went out. And he started being corrupted. I believe he started being deformed as well. Uh, corruption takes on all kinds of waves. Uh, manifestations of corruption. Our whole world's full of it. But the thing is, in heaven, there's none of it. Including our bodies, including everything around us. But in Satan's case, we see that he was, came and as Jesus said, he fell to the earth. Now let's go ahead and look at Genesis 1. And uh, Well, you know what? We, can, we can't read all of this. Uh, these are whole chapters in Genesis. We don't have time, but most of you are familiar with it. There's uh, the point number three and four. We're talking about Adam and Eve. And so we'll just go over that. Uh, they're there to read in your Bible in your spare time. But when he fell to earth, after he fell, God created, he formed the earth and stuff, as it says in the Bible. And, and we get into that in other classes. But the thing is, that what happened is he created Adam and Eve. And they were perfect. And they had one thing like Satan not to do. Not to eat a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the tree was not an apple tree. The tree was actually a fruit that we're not aware of. It was a fruit of knowledge. Because they only knew good. They was in a perfect place. They were naive. I believe they fell at a very early time in their existence. They didn't have uh, procreation at the time yet. They didn't come together to have families or anything like that. And what happened is, I don't have a drawing board or chalk, but you see in my first uh, handout, there's a, a drawing here of a Christian. What happened to Adam and Eve is they're created with a soul, the person you are. They're created with a nature, the species they was, those human species. And they were perfect in their nature. Just like Jesus was perfect in his nature when he became a man. He was 100% man in his nature, 100% God in his soul, the person he was. But the fact is, they were perfect. When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they became corrupted. And that corruption then would be passed down to the rest of their species. That's the reason why Adam and Eve were the first. But everybody that followed them were of the same species. So what happened is they ended up, uh, and God all knew all this was going to happen. So he allowed for it. He allowed Satan to be here, and this is really Satan's society. This is, he brought one third of the angels. It was going to happen on earth with his children. It's sort of like, uh, yeah, we, we you had a baby here and you got a chocolate bar there. And is this baby going for the chocolate? Yeah, yeah I think he's going to go for the chocolate sooner or later. And, but I already know that I provided a redemption for this baby. That out of this creation, I'm going to have something that I never had, God would say. I'm going to have people that are of my species. See, the angels are not of the species of God. Adam and Eve was not of the species of God. They were of the species of man. But you said the angels were created by God. So created by God. Creation. This table was created by a carpenter. doesn't make it a carpenter. Okay. So you can be a creation. All these things are creations of God. But the wood is still a creation of God on the planet. But it's not God. 
See, the species is who you are. See, God has a whole creation. Well, yeah, that's true. There are people that think everything is God. But the fact is, God can create something, but it's not Him. It's not a manifestation of Him. It's sort of like my stomach is part of my body. I can eat something, and it goes to my stomach. Immediately, is it part of my body? No, it's contained no. within my body. But that hamburger is not really part of my body. Right. Eventually, that hamburger, in this case, in this world, is going to turn to waste. <laughs> but it's not part of my body. So God, in the same way, can create everything. And it's His creation. But it's not manifestations of God. Satan is not a manifestation of God. He's anti-God. Antichrist is not a manifestation of God. He's anti-God. When you say earth is hell itself? Well, no. Say no. no. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I think we've got to move on because we see all these things in this chart if we study this chart. Um, so let's go ahead and move on because there's so much here that we're not going to get into hardly any of it. So uh, bottom line is man fell. There was a reason for that. God was going to have children. See, when I'm not born again, I'm not God's child. I'm God's creation. See, that's a false teaching that goes around that everybody's going to heaven. We're all God's creation. We're all God's family. Well, why would we be born again then? We don't need to be born again if we're already God's family, if we're already part of God's species. See, God's species is individual. He's a trinity. He's special. For him to have a family, he's got to create a special scenario. Now, the soul is the person you are. You'll always be that soul. God wants to redeem the soul, the person you are. The way he's going to do that is by changing your species. We were once the species of human, humanity, man. We're born in that, and that species is corrupted, and it is corrupting the world. That species is destined for destruction because it's corrupted. But we have an opportunity to become a new species by asking Jesus Christ into our heart, we get the new nature, which is the divine nature, as opposed to our old nature, our fallen nature. The divine nature is actually the Holy Spirit, the Jesus Christ, the Spirit that He sends in His name coming into our heart. That's what makes us a new creation. God calls His people a new creation. What is that new creation? That new creation is new children of God. He calls these people children of God, His children. Now, He wouldn't have this creation, family, if it wasn't for this whole process. <clears throat> now, he's agonizing through it, just like a lady agonizes through birth. Who's agonizing? Uh, he was mentioned about birth pains. God is having birth pains with his family. Believe me, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's cried before. He has grieved over those that are lost. And they will become lost. But he knows that there's some that won't. By their choices, they decide to receive what God offers. <laughs> and anyways, bottom line is, well, let's go ahead and look ahead, because we're kind of jumping ahead, and let's just jump up there. We can see in the Old Testament, people looked to the Lamb of God for their redemption. That's uh, mentioned there, and uh, it's uh, the Lamb of God. Who is that Lamb of God? Verse 5 uh, talks about John 1.36. In the New Testament, we look back to the Lamb of God. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to the Lamb of God and had lamb sacrifices. But uh, verse 5, uh, I mean... Uh, Note 5, John 1, 36. Who would like to read that real quick? And looking upon Jesus as, as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Okay, now all through the Bible it talks about the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's a sacrifice for our sins so that we could become a new species. It's not automatic. And God didn't predestine us, each one, well, you're saved and you're lost. That would eliminate us from any judgment of our own decisions and responsibility for the things that we've done in our life. God illuminates everybody. And we went into classes about that. But we won't get into We don't have time for that sort of thing now. They're already on tape anyway, on the videos. That if you're interested, can, you can, can see. Can I read 29 as well? Please? Go ahead. 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There it is right there. He takes away the sin of the world. Now... Some people think it's the whole world at that time, and he actually is capable of taking all the sin of the world away. So what happens, though, but we have to choose to receive that. He opens a cell door, but we have to walk out mm -hmm. and meet him. So bottom line is, Jesus, uh, at the end of this time, as we see here, he's going to come in the clouds, verse 6. We don't have time to read uh, these. Uh, they're all there, and they're listed there. You can look them up yourself. I'm just going to go through so we can get to the, more of the points that has been brought up. 
And uh, so we know that at the end of this church age, there is a rapture. Rapture is where you get caught away. There's already been raptures in the past. Uh, Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. And Jesus was raptured. A lot of people was raptured that rose from the dead uh, at his resurrection. So there's raptures throughout the Bible. After we're raptured, there's other raptures in, in, uh, in uh, the tribulation. But I believe the Bible is very clear that before the tribulation starts, and at the end of the church age, Jesus comes back and he takes his people home. There's a rapture that happens. We go to the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, we are actually judged for our works. Not whether or not we're going to be saved or not. This is not the judgment seat of the great white throne where people are judged about their works, whether or not they get into heaven or not. This is about the people that are already in heaven. They're already children of God. They've asked Jesus to be in their uh, heart. They are raptured. They're at the wedding feast of the Lamb, it's called. It's where we're going to get rewards. It's a fellowship. It's a party. It's a great time, but it's expose also. All the sins will be removed from us. We will acknowledge them. We will see their destructive forces. There are people that didn't get along before. We'll also see why they didn't get along. It was all about that human nature and how that human nature, the old man, will go and leave in them only the divine nature, children of God, and their souls will unite. They'll be like one as far as they'll be in love, they'll walk in love, they'll walk in understanding. There'll be no misunderstandings in heaven. Everything will be acknowledged and everything will be revealed. Everything will be understood. We'll have the mind of Christ. And we'll see everything clearly. We'll have a unity there like we've never had on earth. And there's going to be peace like we've never seen. There's going to be a unity and a peace that we will not be able to imagine here on earth. Well, that's going to all start at the judgment seat of Christ. And at the end of the judgment seat of Christ is the return of Christ to the earth. He brings his government back. Those that are being judged and prepared will come back to this earth and uh, the tribulation will end. On the chart there you see that at the end of the tri tribulation, when Jesus returns with his saints, there is a judgment of the nations. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be judged and they'll be cast directly into the lake of fire. Now Jesus comes back, there's the Antichrist nations, and that was the people that took the mark of the beast. Like in Hitler's time, they actually didn't hide Christians. There were some that did, and they would have been more righteous. But those that actually persecuted Christian or Jewish people and Christians in camps, those would be the people he's referring to there. And they are actually separated, the separation of the nations. All the Antichrist nations is removed, and they go to hell at that point when Jesus comes back. There's a judgment day that starts there. And then the thousand-year reign with him will start at that point. At that point... It's the day of the Lord. A day is as a thousand years, and he will start to rule and reign from the time that when he comes back, and he'll rule and reign physically from Jerusalem, and it'll be his government. During that time, Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning, and Satan is bound. He's in a pit for a thousand years. So there's no temptations from Satan or his angels. Jesus is going to be a righteous government. There's going to be people born during that time, and during that time, they actually uh, replenish the earth. It's going to be a very prosperous time. And at the end of that time, it says, and let's look at this uh, little uh, verse here, in Revelations 20, 7 and 8. At the end of that time, Satan is let loose for a short season. Uh, a lot of times people don't even, they're not even aware of that, but some people wonder why would that be. And that's kind of bringing up the very question that's been asked at the beginning of the class. Why did God allow Satan to do the things he did? Why does all these things transpire in the world that we have now? And here we go again. After a perfect world, in a sense, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, he has people that are sinful, born, procreating with more sinful people, but he has his own righteous government coming back from heaven with him who have immortal bodies. Jesus is immortal. He has a resurrection body. <clears throat> He's the government. He has his government throughout the world, and they're doing natural things, and they're building houses, and there's a lot of things talking about, you know, what they're doing as far as all the good things, because their old nature is suppressed. As a matter of fact, there's one verse that says, if a child dies at 100 years old, it's considered accursed. Well, that child is cursed simply because he was sinful to the point that he had capital punishment fall upon him. See, capital punishment is the death the child will have because he was considered accursed to society. And people will see that and say, well, you know what? I don't want to fall under that kind of punishment. God will authorize capital punishment. But he won't have to do it much. Because you do it a couple of times and it comes swift. And all of a sudden people realize, well, you know, I'm going to keep myself in check. I'd rather live through this nice paradise and I'm not going to do what he did. And they will learn quick. And God will 
have strict rules of what you do and what you don't do. And he will enforce those rules. That's what the Bible says very clearly in the verses are all there. At the end of that time, Satan is let loose. There's a lot of people born. Now people wonder what about the babies that were born? Or babies that weren't born, that died before the age of accountability. I believe that they go to this time. God is able to bring them to that time. God has shown people move through time and times, uh, different times. And Mo Moses went through a different time, uh, back and forth. But the fact is, <clears throat> and so did Philip and different people in the Bible. But the fact that he can change time, he's did that a couple times in the Old Testament. But the babies actually grow up. They will have an ability to make a choice before the end of the thousand years. No babies will be born during the end of the thousand years. Probably the last hundred years, nobody's going to be having babies anymore. Because they won't be babies when Satan is let loose. Everybody will mature. They'll recognize the government of God. They'll be able to make their own decisions. Anybody in history, all the angels that ever was created had made a decision. One third of them went with Satan. Two thirds stayed with God. All of mankind, that age of accountability, they reached that, have made a decision either to be with Satan or with Jesus. The babies did not make a decision yet. They will have an opportunity. Nobody gets a free pass. Everybody gets a choice. And that choice will be had at the end of the millennium when Satan is let loose again. And therefore, they'll have the same choice Adam and Eve had. And uh, let's go ahead and read that. Uh, who's got that? First, uh, Revelation 27 and 8. And we'll have to close. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from prison and will go out and to deceive the nations and all in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them that for battle the number they will be like sand of the seashore. So it's going to be a huge number that Satan gathers together. When he uses terms like sand of the seashore, stars, like he had uh, to Abraham, that's a number we can't count to in our lifetime. We can count up to a certain number in, in our lifetime, but this is beyond that number. It's like 100,000 million, whatever. It's not that many. But uh, the fact is it's a large number, and it's visualizing this right here. Yes. It's, it's of the people that live here for a thousand years under Jesus Christ. That's, 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 that's right. where the number comes from. That's where the number comes from. And it's not all the people, because we are already redeemed. We're children of God. We're part of God's family. We're part of His government. But there's people that come through the tribulation. Some of them were young. Some of them were parents. They didn't receive the mark of the beast. They entered into the great uh, millennium of Jesus, a thousand years, and they had babies. And they had more babies. And just like Egypt, uh, they multiplied, Israel multiplied in Egypt, except for this won't be any bondage, they're going to multiply. One plus one equals two, and then two plus times two, and then it just becomes a, just becomes a large number of people here on earth, because there's going to be no death, unless you fall under the punishment of death. Because people will be able to live like before the flood up to a thousand years old at that time. Everything will change at that time. The Bible is very clear about that. But the fact is, at the end of that, Satan is released so that they have a choice. And a lot of them don't make the right choice, apparently. Why would anybody follow Satan? Well, he's going to tell them, throw off God's rules. I'll, I'll vote for me, I'll make you free. You know, and they're going to somehow go with that. They're going to say, you know what, he's so convincing. I think he's got a shot at this. He's got a plan. I'm going to go with him. I can send him be free. That, that's, what, that's what the Bible basically says happens. Now, whether we agree with it or not, God's word will stand true. And that's what happens here. It says a great number falls. And then what happens here is verse um, point 15. In that same area, Revelation 20, let's look at 11 through 15. 11 through 15. Yeah. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. See, that's at the end of the millennium. Mm -hmm. And there was found no place for them. Another dimension. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the death were, dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Okay, in the book of eternal life, you're born into one book of life, mortal life, and then if you transfer to the book of eternal life, it means that you become part of God's family. If you did not, then uh, basically you're going to be judged there. And then the verses here, basically, uh, they end up going to hell. But the thing is that hell is described in this, their... Uh, as a bad place. Hell actually comes to the judgment. Everybody in hell goes to the judgment seat of uh, Great White Throne Judgment. 
And the lake of fire is a permanent place. Hell is right now in the center of the earth. The earth floods away. The center of the earth is relieved and it gets cast into the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. And then in the lake of fire, that's permanent. It's forever. It says that they're there forever and ever. So hell becomes part of that and there's a new earth created. So the new earth doesn't contain any hell. It's not down anymore. It's a lake of fire. It's a graveyard in heaven. And that's forever for all the new creations in the new heaven and new earth will look and they'll realize the history of sin and the season of sin resulted in this painful destruction. So new creations in the future will step out and say, you know what? I choose not to do that, what Satan did. I choose not to do that, what Adam and Eve did. I choose to stay perfect because Satan was ignorant, Adam and Eve was ignorant. But in the future, because of the season of sin, there will be no ignorance about God as a warrior. God rules. Nobody could challenge God, not even Satan, his highest creation. Nobody would want to challenge God, because if they did, they'd end up in this situation. And hellfire is forever a monument. It's like we go to the graveyard to remember. You will remember the price of sin. In heaven, you'll never forget it. But it won't be on the forefront of our mind, because we'll be surrounded by perfection. And the perfect place to contain sin is a garbage dump of hellfire. The graveyard, where those were wasted in order to have those that were not wasted become part of God's family and become part of the new creation of heaven and earth and the things that are forever going to be continued to be added to. Is there any questions about that? We're pretty much out of time. So why would God create us in order to go through that and then still judge us on it and expect perfection? So no, He doesn't expect sin perfection. Evilness. He, he expects love, not perfection. He will make us perfect. We cannot make ourselves perfect. Sure. What he says is to love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, you committed a sin in the Old Testament. Of course. Want me to explain why? Yes. The reason why is because God was using a particular people to bring apart his written word. He had to keep this society from corrupting itself, even though that society did corrupt itself by its neighboring nations more than once. And that corruption was illustrated in the Old Testament more than once, and they fell from their position of power. But they raised, reached a position of power through David, who was a man after God's own heart. He handed it to Solomon. So, he, he built a great uh, nation from there. Right. But then his own corruption was led astray through his wives and stuff like that, and it started falling. The whole idea was God is keeping his gem separated from the world. The whole process of separation from the world is taught throughout the Bible because it will pollute us. And that's what God was doing. He's clearing a place for his nation to bring about his son, and his word, and that Satan would want to pollute at all costs. Now, he did that before the flood. He was trying to corrupt the whole world, and he did it except for one family, then corrupt their bloodline with angelic problems and different situations that they had back then. So God had to take that and clean that all off the face of the plate. And then he took this one family and said, out of you, I will make my nation that's going to bring about my son, and out of the procreation of Noah come Abraham, and from Abraham came Jesus. This one place God had high rules for. But the fact is, that was a line that he was protecting, <clears throat> to protect his word from corruption, from what Satan was doing, what society around him was doing. And he kept cleaning the plate, cleaning the plate, so that his son could come up and he could have this word produced for us, for our benefit. Now, sometimes it looks harsh, but usually discipline is not fun. But sometimes it's necessary to keep corruption at bay. And that's what God is doing throughout the Old Testament. Now, we don't realize how corrupt those people were. They just this says a few things. But they were torturing people. They were, but God had a plan that he had to preserve in the Old Testament. And they had rules. And he had to show that he was, number one, holy to the third degree. Holy means that he basically wants things done right. And he doesn't like sloppy, sinful lifestyles. And he had to make that clear. I'm not pleased with these things. It's not like I'm the grandfather in the sky that says, oh, I'm, I'm Santa Claus and everything goes with me and I'm just going to bless you all no matter what you do. 
He had to show that he has standards. Uh, it's hard to get into a 20-minute discussion because uh, you really need all the ground rules. Right. And right. Uh, otherwise, you don't know why this guy's thrown out. You know, in a baseball game. Why is that not working? <laughs> you know, well, that's the rules. That's the yep. way it works. Yep. Yep. So you guys get the ground rules.